afternoon and welcome to First Financial Biz Beat, presented by the Business Courier. I'm Kyla Woods. A new job, of course, can be both exciting and nerve-wracking. Well, imagine taking over an arm of the world's largest charity as a worldwide pandemic begins to rage. On the front page centerpiece this week, the new CEO of United Way is off and running. Maura Ware talked with Courier reporter Chris Wetterick about how the agency will change in the wake of the pandemic while also dealing with other challenges. Thanks for uh, having me, Kyla. And uh, this is Myra Weir, the uh, newish CEO of the United Way. She's been on the job since March. She started a, a little bit early because of the COVID crisis. Um, Myra, the United Way is, has kind of come up the COVID-related problems hard over the past four months with a number of initiatives, including the, the COVID Regional Response Fund. Tell us a little bit about where that stands and when it comes to overall strategy, how do you see the agency continuing to respond to this crisis? Yeah, no, it was a wonderful partnership we, we had with the Greater Cincinnati Foundation, and we collectively you know, immediately came together and jointly raised over $7 million. So clearly the generosity of the community was overwhelming, the response. And then what we also did collectively is deploy those resources back into the community because we knew families needed help today. Um, folks went to work on that Sunday evening. Let's say you were working at a restaurant and you found out that night that your restaurant was closing and maybe you were counting on your tips to buy food, um, pay your rent. So we were really intentional about making sure that we collected the, those dollars quickly. We focused in initially on four areas, uh, shelter, food security, senior services, um, and child care. But as other things popped out, we we were really flexible and making sure that we could meet that th those needs. Um, again, the fund was very successful, and so we eventually knew that we had to get back to doing what we do day to day. Not that we thought COVID uh, certainly hadn't uh, the impact hadn't impact, you know, finished with the community, but United Way has been very intentional co continuing on our efforts with that. So, specifically, the campaign is all about COVID nineteen and really disproportionality because we knew families that were impacted by COVID nineteen were already families that were living in poverty were just Unfortunately impacted. So, um, a part of you can't, from my perspective, you can't talk about one without the other in terms of equity and inclusion. So, everything we're doing right now is focused on COVID response. So, we want to be able to respond immediately now. What can we do to help families now? But also thinking about on the long term, we know that this is going to be a two, three, five year, potentially seven year impact in our community with families, um, you know, families living in poverty. These, what happened with COVID 19 was a huge impact and sent them back. So, how do we help them? even regain that where they were before and then continue on that 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 pathway forward uh, so we're going to be focused in on that uh, the, the areas that we are really honing in are going to be basic needs financial stability quality education and health and how are those um, four pillars really wrapping services around families so that we can help them as they move forward you know when you probably started interviewing for this job uh, you, you had no idea i'm sure that the impact that COVID-19 and the kind of the national anti-racism movement that continues to build stream would have um, on our world and on our region. Has that changed uh, the, the, how you think about the job at all? And, and will it change the, the course of the United Way's mission? Well, I mean, everything for all of us, the world is different. I mean, what's happened in the last few months has changed all of us. I would say coming to this job, I really wanted to you know, build upon the great history of the United Way, but also really be intentional about how we engage the community in a different way. So it was really focused on bringing that piece. We do a fantastic job of donor engagement, but really how we engage in the community, because the more voices you have at the table, the more different thoughts that you have coming at you, you can think about the best programming and the best way to, from a collectively coming together think through how you change systems so i would say that that continued to be a focus but it was certainly accelerated when you thought about the needs of the community so really we were very intentional about engaging the community quickly what are the immediate needs how can we be responsive and then thinking through down the road how do we continue to be responsive on the long term um, not only today tomorrow but next year and the year after and how do we build systems of care our systems to all, to wrap around families and then challenge us also to think not only about programming but how do we as a region think about the systems or the barriers that are impacting families that are impacted negatively I, you know through equity um, or poverty poverty and so how are we collectively coming together to think about that great and you know I, a lot of people probably i'm sorry go ahead i would say is that you know i've been fortunate to have been in this work with the community for over 20 plus years. So I think building upon, you know, been very involved in the community job and family services. I started out as a frontline child welfare worker. So families and systems and individuals have been very much about who I am and how I 
to you know come to this work so i really believe i was just building upon that and my hope is that in this position um, i can use those great years of experience um, and evolution in terms of how i understand family systems and engagement to really help us do work in really engaging individuals and families and bringing them to the table and letting them drive the decisions versus us driving it and letting individuals in the community drive how our work is um, how we do our work and a lot of people probably don't know this, but uh, Job and Family Services, they have this enormous budget. It's more than $2 billion a year, and it's they got 900 employees, and you spent 27 years there. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you wanted this job and, and believe it's a good fit. Well, you know, I think uh, starting out, and you probably heard me talk about this before, I actually was in the business sector and then was a big sister to a foster child, and that changed me. That volunteer experience changed me to, you know, quit, switch careers, and I was very passionate about my volunteer work, and I, I feel lucky to be doing some, you know, to be in a profession where I'm very passionate about helping individuals and families. So to me, this is just an evolution of, of that journey, and really how can I continue that, that journey, but, you know, coming from a big organization with, you know, managing all those different resources, um, I really thought to myself, this is the next bet, the next step in that journey in terms of how do I engage the community and also really think strategically. Um, how do we deploy resources from, from you know, I, I think the benefit now from coming from job and family services is seeing how, how big systems work, but also the different providers and how do we come together and look it through, how do we deploy our you know, precious resources the best that we, we can for families. And hopefully, you know, with them driving it, we can help do some prevention work and we can help do some system change that really is going to be impactful in the long term for our region. None of, not, not one organization or person can do this work alone. It requires all of us coming together, you know, putting aside our, 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 our you know, beliefs or biases and saying, what is best for this community? How do we collectively think through how to deploy these resources? We're also interdependent on each other and um, core to that are gonna be families and individuals in terms of how they educate us to, to do better and to, and to make sure that we're doing everything we can to help them. Great, well, Mara, I really appreciate you being with us and uh, Kyla, back to you. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, more disappointing job news this week. Jobless claims rose for the first time since March. One in five workers are now relying on unemployment checks. And the $600 a week extra benefit many have been getting expires next week. The checks have saved many Americans. At the same time, they've made it tough for some local businesses to find people to work. If you can make more and not work, why not take that program? We're here, we're hiring. We'd be glad to interview you and put you on. <laughs> That's all. Congress is negotiating another aid package that might extend that benefit, but the payments will likely be lower. One of Ohio's most powerful politicians is at the center of the state's largest ever racketeering scheme. Larry Householder is among five people charged in the $60 million corruption case. The feds say the group used a nonprofit to funnel the money into their pockets. Uh, at the heart of this is a billion dollar taxpayer funded nuclear bailout bill. The feds say that dark money was used to help influence its passage and squash the effort to repeal the law. We have to take our resources away from those real victim cases and investigate and prosecute uh, some politicians who just won't do their damn job. That's what makes me angry. There are bipartisan efforts supported by Governor Mike DeWine to cancel that law before taxpayers start footing the bill in January. Two local frishes are closing for good. The coronavirus pandemic is forcing the restaurants downtown and in Liberty Township to close shop. The Carew Tower location just opened two years ago. Six other local locations will be drive through and carry out only. And Braxton is expanding. The Covington-based brewery is buying three points in Pendleton. It'll be its first Ohio location. They'll keep the head brewer and see who else wants to stay on. The goal is to open around Labor Day. Still to come on First Financial Biz Beat, lessons in a pandemic. These are like half notes, and then you're going really fast. How music teachers are navigating a new universe of learning. And congratulations to Jamie Ritter Horn, the marketing director for Johnson Investment Council, is another one of our 40 under 40 honorees.
childhood piano teacher is a little different these days. Kara Huber's studio is in her living room. There's a computer, a microphone, and three cameras pointed at her grand piano. It's the new frontier of remote learning. Huber, who's getting her doctorate at UC's College Conservatory of Music, says the remote lessons have actually improved her teaching skills because instructions have to be very clear. And there's another silver lining. I've been able to have some students from all over the world, actually. I have a new student in Calgary and one in Illinois and Michigan. And so it's really opened up some, um, some boundaries that were there before. And Becky Wood used to be a teacher, too. Now she leads an investment firm managing $8 billion in assets. The change came in New York City. The big city lifestyle on a teacher's salary just didn't jive. So she took an entry-level job, eventually moved back to Cincinnati, and two decades later, she's the CEO of FEG Investment Advisors. Her advice on how to be an effective leader, be authentic. You need to build strong and trusting relationships. And the way you build strong and trusting relationships is by listening and understanding their point of view. That doesn't mean, though, that they're always going to agree with your decisions. But if you can communicate and they understand, they will help and uh, really build a, a trust with you and be behind you. Great advice there. And success stories are hard to come by during a worldwide pandemic. Ready Cincinnati is one of them. Courier publisher Jamie Smith sat down with Kim Lauterbach, the Economic Development Organization's CEO, about keeping that momentum moving forward. Thank you, Kyla. Kim, thanks for being on today. We really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. I want to get right into our questions. You recently announced Ready Cincinnati's 2019 metrics virtually. Can you share a little bit about what successes you guys had in 2019? Absolutely. It was an interesting year from us because we had to pivot with our annual meeting, not being able to release our results publicly due to the pandemic. I'd like to thank you, Jamie, and your staff because the Business Courier was a great partner in helping us create a public-facing hub to share this information. Um, but I will tell you that we hit on all cylinders in 2019 we met and actually even surpassed the majority of our goals, creating over 6,400 jobs for the region, bringing in $438 million in new payroll, and really seeing uh, more success than we have in most years in prior. That's awesome. Now, I know you also virtually uh, re awarded your annual growth award winners. Can you tell our audience what the growth awards are and why you give them? Absolutely. This was also a challenge for us. This is a big part of our annual meeting where we recognize companies who have stepped up and done really unique uh, and very impactful projects for the region. Typically, these are decided by local economic developers in our business community. And once again, we use the content hub we created with the Business Courier to celebrate those wins virtually. So I would encourage your viewers to check them out. We did celebrate five award winners this year across all different parts of our region from expansion to attraction. So it's definitely worth some time to read through those stories. Excellent. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about your success in 2019. Obviously, the pandemic has changed what 2020 looks like. But is there any recent ready projects, uh, project wins that are going to create jobs and capital expansion here in our region? Absolutely. I think it's important to reiterate that even given the change in the way we're all working, your ready team is still working really hard on expansion and traction opportunities. In fact, we had a phenomenal first quarter, one of our strongest ever. And this month alone, we'll take a seven additional projects uh, for approvals. In fact, you would have seen an announcement just this week for York Street Foods, bringing 128 new jobs to the city of Sharonville. So I'd say stay tuned for the other six that we'll be announcing. Um, but we're about 1,600 new jobs into um, this year, which is slower than normal for us, but however, pretty impressive given the pandemic and the situation that we're facing. Absolutely. Your team, meet, your team moves at such a fast pace normally, so I know this pandemic isn't going to slow them down. Thank you. Earlier this week, uh, Ready Cincinnati was working with both the Urban League and Jobs Ohio, delivering PPE toolkits to small businesses. Can you talk a little bit about Ready's involvement in that? I think this is a really important initiative and one that I think probably most people don't know that Ready uh, has been involved with. You know, I'd give a shout out to Jobs Ohio. Since March the 15th, they have created 10 new programs and released $250 million, really designed to soften the impact of COVID-19 on small business. 
Um, that's really been about 1,500 different um, small businesses impacted and 300,000 jobs that have been, I think, retained due to the efforts. But the most recent initiative that you would have seen was the creation of 15,000 safety toolkits designed to help small businesses access that much needed PPE to make sure their employees stay safe. And of those 15,000, Ready Cincinnati and Southwest Ohio received 2,100 kits that were asked to be distributed to small businesses, meaning 100 or less employees. You know, we found the perfect partner with the Urban League of Greater Southwest Ohio and Jobs Ohio distributing those kits to small businesses that did not have access to other PPE that will help keep their employees safe, help them weather the storm, and make sure that we keep the economy moving in Southwest Ohio. You know, that's great. We talk so much about Ready Cincinnati and how important you guys are to the growth and expansion in our region. But that's just, I think, another area that shows how much you guys also care about retention and helping the businesses that we have here stay here. So thank you and thank your team for all the work you're doing to keep our region uh, moving forward. So thank you, Jamie. you on the show again, because as I said, your team just moves at lightning speed. So thanks so much for being on today. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. Thanks. Next up on First Financial Biz Beat, meet two of the nation's most popular podcast hosts. By the way, the oldest is 10 years old. A local family is getting national attention for creating a podcast about black history and current events. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Avery, what are you talking about? I'm getting ready for the march. The march? No, march. It's another word for protest or rally. Oh, the Black Lives Matter protest. Oh, those voices. The Osmer family created Hey Black Child. The weekly show is hosted by 7-year-old Jackson and 10-year-old Avery. Their parents do the scripting and sound engineering. It didn't start because of everything that's happening, but man, the time could not be more perfect because we know that in homes all across America, people are trying to have the tough conversations with their kids about race. Hey Black Child is currently the third most popular podcast in the arts category. Well, in this role, I'm usually the one asking the questions, but earlier this month, I had a chance to sit down with First Financial's retail region president, Ilaria Rollins, to talk about my work and the importance of the current movement we're seeing to improve inclusion in our community. Kyla, thank you so much for thank you. coming today. I am excited to reverse roles yes. with you. <laughs> <laughs> you have had a robust career. Tell me what's guided you along your path. Well, I think what's always been consistent for me is my desire to help people. So it's always been at the core of everything that I've ever done. So um, whether that was through news stories, which really is talking to a person, learning um, their purpose and their goal and, and what they're trying to communicate, and then helping them broaden that. So whether it's on a news story that broadcasts or whether it's a written story. So a lot of news that people don't uh, realize is a lot of it is writing. So you're writing a lot and you're sharing in blogs and you're sharing in digital platforms. So um, really just helping people tell their stories. And then as an entrepreneur um, through Crowder Camera, I help people with sharing public speaking tactics and yes. learning how to better communicate. Um, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs themselves who have small businesses and they really love their product and they they know their product but they don't know how to tell other people sure. about it so I'm really sure. passionate about working in that landscape as well nice what or who has this inspired you most throughout your career yeah that's always a tough one. well <laughs> I won't say it, it's not tough to think of who it is but but I've I've grown in the reasons why she has been an inspiration so Oprah Winfrey has been probably one of my biggest inspirations love her. Um, she's a black woman yep. she has built a media empire she was always really excellent at conducting interviews and I'm really passionate about long-form interviews sit downs like what we're doing yeah. and she's always used that as her platform her primary platform but in addition to that um, Oprah has really helped me understand the importance of giving back as a philanthropist mm -hmm. of understanding your impact so not just oh let's get on TV and make a show but she, uh, one interview I watched of hers actually where she was being interviewed she talked about with the Oprah show how she became very intentional with her producers and with um, her production crew about who are we inviting onto the show what are we using this platform for 
who's going to be impacted mm. by it? And I, that's always resonated with me because I, that has been the goal for me as well. And even more so, you know, as I get older and as my career continues. So she has certainly been a huge inspiration for me. Nice. Tell me about the largest obstacle that you've had to face. Um, I would say, you know, I, I'll be really honest and transparent because I think it's important. Um, I can be hard on myself. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll get caught up in like one mistake or one error. And um, I think working in, in live television for so many years in you know in, uh, the earlier part of my career uh, you can easily get tripped up and derailed if you make one small mistake because in live TV you can't take it back um, but one <laughs> thing I've learned is to give myself grace I'm really good at giving that to everyone else and mm -hmm. I'm really good at telling other women they should be kind to themselves and so that is something I'm coming into so the obstacle has been you know, being hard on myself, but right now I'm trying to remedy that. I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself giving myself more grace, so I'm, I'm proud of that. That's nice. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> Many are reflecting today on what they can do with their organizations and lives to be more inclusive mm -hmm. and diverse. Um, what are some big conversations that should be taking place today to make the world a better place? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. And it's an important question yeah. right now and, and as we move forward. So we've seen a lot of action, of course, in the streets with protests. And now we have, to, and the protests are important. I want to say that. They are important. Um, but now we have to move the protests into policies and we have to mm -hmm. turn the movement into, uh, the moment into a movement that yeah. moves within our corporations, within our networks, our environments. And we have to move to having really intentional conversations. So whether they're small groups, you know, five or 10 people in breakouts, or larger groups within companies that are, you know, 20, 50, 100 people, where we're discussing why this moment is important. Mm -hmm. uh, what changes can we implement to really create sustainable change? Diversity and inclusion makes us stronger. Having more women, having more black people, people of color, um, our LGBTQ community, having everyone at the table, making decisions, and really being a part of what we're doing only makes us better as a society. So I'm grateful for this, uh, the light that's being shined on this, and I'm hopeful that it really creates sustainable change. Such an opportunity. It is. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank spending you. time today. It's been great. Thank Thanks. you. And thanks so much to the team at First Financial Bank for inviting us to have this conversation in their beautiful downtown studio. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Kyla Woods. Have a great weekend.